Hello. And we are now recording. Welcome everybody to Watch Moth August on a wild, wet and windy Friday evening. <laughs> Double check we've yeah, got thanks, everybody thanks in. For, thanks for coming along. It's nice to see you all. So I'm just going to wait another moment and see if we've got any more to join us. And then we'll run through a little bit of housekeeping and then get on with the fun and games for this evening. So we are going to be recording this evening's event. Um, you've got a, a little name next to your picture on the screen. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with, um, with Zoom, if you would prefer to re remain anonymous, if you can click on participants and um, click on your own name, you're able to rename yourself. So if you would rather not be, for example, Jenny Ayrton this evening, but I'd like to be have a famous name or something else, then please feel free to do that. And also, if you would rather not be featured in the video, um, which we'll be sharing on YouTube and so on for people who haven't been able to join us this evening, um, then please turn off your video camera. Um, but otherwise, we'd love to see your faces this evening. Um, and it's only ever going to be a tiny little square in amongst lots of others, because most of the evening we'll be focusing in on our presenters. Down the bottom of your screen, you'll also have a chat function. So you're all muted at the moment. Um, and I'm afraid you will do through the session because we've got quite a few people with us this evening and otherwise it, it gets a bit chaotic. And um, so if you've got questions, comments, um, please put them into the chat. We'd love to, for example, now, just as a little bit of a tester, um, find out where you're all watching us from. Um, what is it that you made you decide to join us this evening? Um, how many there are in your household that are watching? Um, anything like that would be great in the chat. We've also got a reactions button down the button um, and you can give us a thumbs up or a hand clap if there's something that you really you know, want to cheer for, that would be lovely. So just a reminder that we are recording. So if you would prefer to remain anonymous, then please turn off your camera and change your name on the um, participants option. And also that any chat or uh, um, reactions would be lovely through the, the chat function. I'm gonna pass over to Naomi, our host for this evening. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to Watch Moths 3. Um, it's going to be an um, amazing evening this evening. We've been getting excited all month actually with what we've got planned tonight. Uh, it's, a, it's a session that is going to be full of energy and ecosystems and where the ecosystems and the energy systems collide sit our little or our moths. Um, we've got this great fascination for moths and there, that is what we're going to be celebrating this evening. We're really grateful to the Arts Council and to Plymouth Energy Community for funding our series of Watch Moths events and, and actually a whole programme of stuff, events and activities which is called Moths to a Flame which we're hoping to take to COP26 next November. So this series is going to run and run, we hope. Uh, we're the Art and Energy Collective and we work creatively to, to tell stories about renewable energy and climate change and get people involved in all that interaction that goes on between creatures, humans and the living systems on the planet. So. Um, we are several people, artists and writers and scientists and makers, and I'm just going to read some of us out that enable this uh, Watch Moths to happen this evening. And if people can just wave so that you can all see our faces and our names, wave and say hello. So I have on my list, we have Jenny Ayrton, who is in charge, really. Hi, evening. good evening. I'm yeah. doing the tech side from this evening from Tavistock. And then we've got Chloe Uden, who's, who's there. Ah, and we're Hector and Felix, and we're in Heather Tree, and we're very excited to be here. Yeah. And we have Miranda Barlow. Hello, I'm, I'm here from Heather Tree this evening. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, Simon Bates. 
in the woods in the wilds yeah, it looks like it simon nice to see you out there in the, in the rain and richard fox who is our new moth expert joining us this month hello richard hi hello hi very nervous about being a uh, so-called moth expert <laughs> well we we all love moths but we're not don't all know as much as you richard i'm sure um, there's Dave Neal, who's the um, who's in our collective and is a laser cutter. Works for Laser Cuts. Are you there, Dave? I'm here. Hello, welcome. Hi. Hello, and Sarah Gillespie, an artist who's going to show us some of our her uh, moth art later. Hello, Hello. Sarah. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. And John Walters is out there as well and who's been here since the beginning, a moth expert. Are you there? Hello, John. <laughs> I'm waving at you. I'm sure I know you are there because I saw you earlier. So yeah. Hi. We... Hi. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hi. John. <laughs> Glad you're smiling. Oh, and you're by a, an interesting I've got, plant. Yeah, I've got a nice plant here as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll... I'll tell you about that later. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, um, so tonight we must get on actually and and tonight is a evening where we're launching this uh, children's book written by Miranda Barlow who you met briefly earlier called The Moth's Whisper and then we've got John and uh, Sarah talking about their uh, art their art in relation to or moth art and why they're doing it and what they do and uh, a whole load of interesting information about the art side of things and then we have our series of people who are watching moths and telling us more and revealing what moths are there and a bit more about their life histories so i should really have a drum roll or a bit of music or something to introduce chloe and miranda for the launch of the book so i'll do this <laughs> Introduce you over to Chloe. I know we published it today. <laughs> 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 it's <Joe again. laughs> yes, it's fine. <laughs> so we're very delighted to be publishing this wonderful book by Miranda called The Moth Whisper. And we're going to be asking you some questions in a minute, Miranda, but we're, we're feeling very excited. Did I see you? Wait, not right now, not right now. Um, so we, um, we're going to be showing a little video of you reading the book in a moment. But we've, yes. got, some, we've got some questions for you. So Felix, no, Hector, come here. What's your question for Miranda about the book? Um, how did you write the book? So how did I write it? Well, I did a lot of research. Basically, I'm a creative writing student at Bath Spa University. Um, and one of my modules at university was a project where we had to work collaboratively with other professionals. And um, I'd written and illustrated a book before. Um, and so this project, when it sort of came into being, was ideal for that. I did a lot of research on moths a lot of research on, on moths and finding out what 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 they do a lot of googling but i've learned a lot more from the watch moths <laughs> that leads us to felix's question very nicely yes um it's very what did you learn about moths well the thing that i learned that I was most astonished about, about moths, um, is that they migrate. And that if the weather conditions are right, they can migrate, I think I read, and please correct me if I'm wrong, up to a hundred kilometers um, in a night, if the weather conditions are right. And they move right across, like from, from Europe, right up to, um, through England, and all the way, sort of, they can be found up in the north of England as well. I think that's the yellow underwing does that. So yes. it's very excited to see. I don't know whether you spotted this in the Devon Moth Group. They've got a really nice Facebook group where you get to see all sorts of pictures of the moth that mothers are discovering. And you have a character in your book called Sid, who's a crimson underwing who appeared in Plymouth for the first time 
in ages, didn't it? Just yesterday or something. Fantastic. I, I wonder where did it come from? Where did you come from? Just in time for your book. We get, um, wait, I think everyone's going to have some wait, questions. Wait, you can ask wait, 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 wait. Um, can I see Joe at all? Wait. Also, Joe's, not, I'm really Joe's, not here. Joe's not here tonight. I'm really okay. sorry. So we've got lots of questions that we're going to add to the um, to the chat while the film is playing. Okay. And if anyone else who's got any questions for Miranda on this exciting evening, please whack it into the chat and we'll ask her after this film. Fabulous. So, I like the warning on it. I liked um, the depth. Hang on, I don't know whether anyone else is experiencing this, but we can't hear. Is, is that a, uh, are there issues all around or is that just? Yeah, I can't hear it either. Oh, come on. Right. Shall we go back to the beginning? Let me stop the share. Let me share the screen. Sorry about that, everybody. We shall try again with the right box this time. Is that better? Better. Cool. The Moss Whisper, written and illustrated by Miranda Barlow. One night, underneath the largest dandelion in the garden, the soil began to stir. A wriggly thing wriggled, snick, snack, crack. And from inside the wriggly thing came a pair of even wrigglier legs. It heaved itself out from inside its pupa. Hi everyone, I'm Marnie, she called. No one replied. Marnie was all alone. I need to find the moon, she muttered. She wasn't sure why or how, but she knew she needed to do it. Her wings had just dried when she saw a beautiful silvery light. The moon, she gasped. She spread her wings and flew towards it. Bonk, bang, ouch! What was that? she asked, falling to earth with a crash. Yeah, that keeps happening to me, called another moth as he fell to the ground beside her. I'm Sid, by the way. I'm Marnie, she answered. Maybe that isn't the moon. Maybe not, said Sid. I can't seem to fly away from it, though. Marnie knew what he meant. It's mesmerising, she said. She really wanted to fly back to it. No, she told herself. Taking a deep breath, she turned away. Sid, where do you think the real moon is? Maybe it's over this thing. Marnie saw a silvery, shimmery glow. Is that the moon? asked Marnie. Let's go and see, said Sid. Ow! Sid spiralled down to earth. Are you all right? Marnie flew to help him. Roaring filled her ears as two pools of light shot towards them. Fly! Marnie shouted. They tumbled over and over and fluttered back down onto a wall. That was close, said Marnie, her wings shaking. She stared at all the lights. Do you think any of these are the moon? I don't think so, said Sid, rubbing his head. I'm going to go and find it, said Marnie. I'll come too, replied Sid. Is the moon here? Marnie asked. I don't think so, said Sid. What about here? Um, no, said Sid. Is the moon here? <coughs> Probably not, coughed Sid. Is that the moon? Marnie asked. No, said an owl. It's an oil tanker. Oh, said Marnie. She and Sid flew out of the owl's way because she looked a bit hungry. Is this the moon? asked Marnie. The owl shook her head. I believe that thing is called a combine harvester, she said. They travelled over forests and fields and met all kinds of creatures. Have you seen the moon? Marnie asked. But none of them had. I think you've been looking in the wrong places, said the owl. Perhaps you should try looking up. So they did. 
the clouds parted and out came the moon, Marnie cried. But we've been getting so confused by all these other lights. What is happening? The owl ruffled her feathers. Humans, she said. They burn coal, oil and gas to make electricity, which they use to light their homes. Their lights confuse us and the smoke that comes from burning all that fuel kills us. We should talk to the humans, Marnie said. They will not hear, answered the owl. Our voices are less than a whisper to them. All the moths, birds, animals and other insects fell silent. What about, Marnie said, what about if we all said it together? And she began to chant, find another way to light the night. The animals, insects and birds began to chant it too. Find another way to light the night. The animals ran off to tell the others as the moths and birds took flight. The chant began to travel around the world and something miraculous happened. Children and young people heard it as if the wind itself had murmured the words. They realised that all the creatures on land and in the sea needed them to make adults change the way they light the night. The children decided to take action to help Marnie, Sid and all of their friends. And you can too. reality colouring in sheet that um that we've produced as part of the project and the boys have um colored theirs in and shared their message and you can too and um, so i'm not sure whether we have got any questions or whether we're running short of time um i think but, i think we'll move uh, well, well go on then chloe what were you going to say i was just going to say up until the end of august We've got a very special thing to offer everyone who's here and anyone that you would like to tell about it. On our website, and I'll share a link in a minute, is a link to how you can get hold of a copy of this. And if you put a coupon code which says dedication in it, then Miranda has agreed very kindly to sign a copy of the book and include a dedication. So to anyway, make sure to hit the notification bell and to like it and subscribe. Yes. Yes. I shall, I'm going to clap and I'm going to put my thumb up. <laughs> thank you. Well done, thank you. And thank you, Miranda. It's now out there. Good. Uh, so we, we move swiftly on from books to moths, to from the mo book about moths to moths themselves and we're we're starting off with Simon, who is in Exeter, in a woodland somewhere, in the wilds when we last saw him, with the light fading fast. Are you there, Simon? Yes, hello everybody, and welcome to this wild woodland. I hope I don't see you tonight, because I'm all alone here. I could do with a, an assistant, but I'll, I'm surrounded by horses that keep thundering around the field next to this woodland. <laughs> Um, I think the first thing I should do is turn the moth trap on, so hang on. Mm. That's good. So oh, there we go, we're running. Um, great to be with you. I'm not going to say very much tonight because I'd really like to hand over to Richard Fox from Butterfly Conservation and I'm delighted that Richard uh, can join us this evening. But uh, one of the things I'm going to try tonight, it's a new thing, I've never tried it before, it's called sugaring because everybody loves a sweet drink, don't they? And moths do in particular, well certain types of moth. Lots of moths are attracted to the light but there are also moths that won't come to light at all. And that's where the sugar comes in handy. So, I've made 
a little concoction here. Anyone guess what's in here? Uh, it looks like it's got some of that, that black treacle. Yeah, yeah, yes, black treacle. It smells delicious, actually. Black Has it got any wine? Any alcohol in it? Secret ingredient, yes, yeah, secret ingredient. Um, you're supposed to put rum in there. Um, I didn't have any rum because um, I'm not a salty sea dog. So I put some whiskey in instead. Um, and the, basically the, the idea with the alcohol is that it makes the moths slightly drowsy and makes them stick around and not fly off, apparently. As I say, it's the first time I've done it, so who knows. Uh, what else is in here? Um, lots of sugar, dark sugar and beer as well, of course. So um, I'll try not to drink this. Um, basically what I'm trying to attract Somebody mentioned, was it uh, Je uh, Chloe, I think, mentioned crimson underwings, mm. Plymouth. So that would be really nice. Um, I'd be very happy with this one at the top here, a red underwing. Um, what would be unbelievable is this one, this beautiful moth with this, whoa, amazing electric blue stripe on the underwing called a Clifton Nonpareil. Wonderful. Mm. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine who's extremely lucky uh, has just moved house in Exeter, put his moth tra trap out in his garden and got a Clifton nonpareil immediately. Unbelievable. Because they're really quite rare. So that's marvellous. Um, so I'll hand over to Richard in a sec. I just want to show you how the mixture goes on. So basically the idea is dip a brush in and take it over to a the trunk of a tree and paint it on like this you paint a stripe like that and get plenty on uh, and it basically drips down like a sap run from when trees have got a wound and the uh, the lovely sugary sap runs out the moths are attracted to that so we're just sort of replicating that natural process so let's see. Let's see what uh, what joy we have with that. Simon, say, I'm an... yeah. so we've got a couple of questions on the chat about whether you have to boil it to make that up, or, or you know, how do you physically make it, and also whether there's any Guinness or honey in there. I guess this as well. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm a novice at it. I mean, there's recipes out there. Bananas. Uh, some people put bananas in it, makes it more sticky. Yes, I warmed it up. But I put the beer in a pot, warmed it up. You don't want to boil it though. Um, I just warmed it up so it was on a simmer, added the sugar and the treacle, stirred it around, let it cool down and then potted it up. Um, yeah, so what was the other question? Uh, whether there was any Guinness or honey in there. Have you heard of recipes with Guinness or honey in them? No. That sounds like a really good combo to me. It, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a robust, a robust combination which is probably going to attract Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay on that note I think we before we get into bears and everything let's stick with moths and go over to over to Richard. Hello Richard. Hi there hi well good luck Simon good luck with your uh, sugaring that's actually as you said it's a really good way of attracting these red underwing moths including the rare uh, migrant species like the dark, yeah, the dark crimson underwing and actually next week next Thursday Friday and Saturday nights is a national event called moth night it takes place every year uh, it's a sort of celebration of moths and moth recording and those crimson underwing species are actually the focus of that so we're hoping that hundreds and hundreds of people all over the UK will be going out spreading those sugar mixtures around and using light to try and attract those moths anyway um, hi, I'm Richard Fox. Um, welcome to my garden here in Abbots Kurzweil. It's the same village where um, some of your regular contributors, Barry and Amy, live. I think it must be the most well-recorded village in Devon, if not Britain, for moths. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is my garden. Um, so just a quick sort of um, look around. I'll show you the traps that I'm going to be running tonight. The garden faces west. 
Um, and obviously there's a stiff southwesterly breeze blowing today, as I'm sure everyone has noticed. So it's not ideal really. I've got the wind blowing straight into the garden. Um, and whilst it's not relatively warm, which is good for moths, um, it, is, uh, it is quite breezy. So I don't know how many moths we'll see in the morning, but we'll give it a go. So if you um, follow me down here, handy helper. Um, so this is my normal garden moth trap. Um, this is a Robinson type trap. And in addition to the usual egg boxes that, uh, that us mothers put in our moth traps for the moths to settle on, I have an addition of a hefty brick here to uh, give it some extra ballast during, uh, during the forthcoming windy evening. I run this one next to this uh, flower bed which has got lots of herbs and things in which are good for wildlife and for moths. It also gives moths places to hide. Uh, if they don't actually go into the trap they can hide in amongst that vegetation and avoid uh, bird predators. Um, so I'll put that one on. Like that, so you can see the light, the lamp just starting up. And then down at this other side of the garden, I've got another little trap that I'm going to be running. Now, this, this habitat probably doesn't look particularly promising, the massive great Leylandii hedge. Um, I don't normally have a moth trap here, but it is probably the most sheltered part of the garden garden tonight with the way that the wind's blowing so I thought I'd give it a try. Also although Leylandii is not a native species there are a few moth species that have colonized Britain. Since we started planting Leylandii and other cypresses all over our gardens a few decades ago, moths that naturally feed on those trees elsewhere in Europe have come up and colonized Britain. So I get species like uh, Blair's shoulder knot, cypress carpet, cypress pug, here in the garden whose caterpillars are feeding on Leylandii. Also have prickly stick insects from New Zealand living in this hedge, which arrived into uh, Tor Bay sometime in the late 1800s by accident being brought in on tree ferns. And they very slowly spread uh, around this part of Devon. So um, even though it's not my favorite plant, it's got its uses. So, um, let me know how we're doing for time, but um, I'll just... Just another okay? min minute, another minute or two, Richard. Okay, all right. So we'll see what comes in. We'll have a look in the morning. Um, as well as being an, a moth enthusiast in my spare time, I also work for the charity Butterfly Conservation, and I actually run our national recording schemes for moths and butterflies. So when people like myself and John and Barry and Amy go out and record moths in Devon, we submit all our sightings, we, we write them down, the species that we've seen and hopefully the numbers that we've seen as well. And those records go into a database both in Devon, where they're shared with the Devon Biodiversity Record Centre and Devon Wildlife Trust so they can be used for conservation. But also they then go on into a thing called the National Moth Recording Scheme, which Butterfly Conservation runs. And from that we can work out how all our moth species are doing, which ones are declining, which ones are increasing, um, how the numbers overall are, are faring and that obviously then is the basis for lots of conservation work. Yeah and we've got a question here actually about if if other people get keen on um, finding out what moths are around, um, should they send in their records every time that they trap moths if they know yeah. what they, you know, if they're sure of their identification? Yes absolutely, yes the more, the more records the better. Um, and you're right about being sure about the identification. The golden rule is if in doubt, leave it out. So you only, you only send in records of things that you're sure about. Although of course there are plenty of places online you can get help by posting pictures to the Devon Moth Group Facebook page, for example, that you mentioned earlier, and experts will help you with your identifications. But yeah, there are lots of interesting things happening in terms of the time of year that different moths are flying. That's changing because of climate change. So yes, we just, we don't want to know that you recorded large yellow underwing in your garden, you know, during the year. We want to know every time you record large yellow underwing because that is shifting over time and that tells us useful stuff as well. Yeah, well, thanks. thanks Richard. I think we better, we better move on because we are just a little tiny tad later than we thought. So thank you very much. Um,
we'll, we might get into conversation and hear from you again later when, when other questions come up. So, sure. okay. we, we, we were going to um, have a film, a short film from Will Scott, who was here last time, and he is on his way up to Scotland. And, and um, he said he might not, it might not work, and I'm not sure that it has. <laughs> including that the film that he done which is actually really interesting but it's a little bit quiet so we're hoping we can show that next september at the end of september at the next watch moss and uh chloe are you are you going to set up a trap in your bathroom yes the boys have been busy setting up the trap in the bathroom and here is a little video of them getting up to it hey i'm hector and he looks <laughs> And um, this is our bathroom moth trap thing. <laughs> and this is a guy, a moth with a radio. This is a moth with a cloak on, throwing the cloak off. And then um, Felix. Daddy, don't leave the door open. <laughs> Keep the latter. I didn't quite hear what you were saying because it was so, a bit quiet. This is what you... was. Don't leave the door open. Keep the light on. Why do you want to? Why do you want him to do those things? Because the last time um we did this, well, not the last time, the first time, Dad left the light off. And what did that mean? That mean not much moths came in. Yeah. So, we're going to see everyone tomorrow. Yeah. And see what we get. Bye. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hector and Felix. So, um, we like... We, we like, like a wide... The bathroom goes. <laughs> yeah. We like a wide range of moth traps and understanding how different people um, do their collecting and identification. So, we love... We've always loved the idea of keeping this bathroom moth trap going and seeing what happens there, haven't we, Chloe? And now we're moving on to Dave, who's got a, another sort of moth trap. Um, Dave, are you there? I'm uh, here. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Dave and Joe. Um, Dave and Joe, me and Chloe, when we were setting up Art and Energy all those years ago, Dave was working with us, weren't you? What, do you want to describe um, what you do, Dave? I, I was. Well, I, I, if I remember rightly, you, you contacted me and, and said that we, we want to try and cut some solar cells. And I had a little bit of a heart attack and thought, I've never, ever cut a solar cell. And I know they're quite expensive. Um, and you came over and explained everything. Can we... We just fell in love, really, didn't we? Well, we did. We did fall in love. <laughs> and we've been, um, Dave has been working with us ever since on laser cutting, all, all sorts of ideas and trying to, and advising about uh, what elements we should research and what laser cutter we should use for what solar cells. So um, it's been uh, great, Dave. And, and you've been so inspired by watch moths that you've made a, uh, flat pack moth trap. Yeah, I I, I couldn't resist it. it there, there was something um, Heath Robinson about me. There's always always has been, and uh, I thought I've got, I've got to have a go at this. Yeah, great. Well, should we watch the film of sure. you constructing it? That's great. If you if there may be questions, and I might talk over it briefly or something, but we'll go for it. That's a horrible picture. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dave Neal and I'm director of Blazer Cuts Limited and we've been working with Chloe, Noeme, Naomi and Jenny uh, at Art and Energy for, well, since almost the beginning, I believe. Um, and we came up with this flat pack idea for the moth trap and we thought you might like to see how it uh, fits together. So simply we take the base and slot one of the sides in and the, the parts are, are held together with uh, a tab and peg system which is actually quite an old 
system of joining wood. You've probably seen it in benches outside pubs, like oak benches. Um, so it's, it's not a unique idea, but it certainly does the job. So we're just putting a few pegs to keep it in place. Now we take one of the sides and you'll see the sides have a, has a support for the acrylic um, which also has a gap at the bottom. So we'll just pop that on. So, and add a few pegs. I, I won't put every single peg in. Um, it actually is, holds it quite well just with a few, but just for the sake of speed, I'll just put a few in. Okay, so we now take the next side. And we'll get this one ready. We don't want to actually push this in completely simply because we need to put the light bar in as well. So I'll just leave that just slightly apart. Now the light bar is in progress. As you can see, this is a prototype, and I've tried um, th these are LED. Um, lights that are uh, UV and can, I think I believe they're used for night fishing. Um, so at the moment we've tried a flat strip and what I want to do is to try this version which is sort of a slightly higher version that might just stick higher than stick up higher out of the box and may be visible to moths at further distance. That's the plan and I hope it works. So we'll just pop that in, that tab through the side there, put a peg in to hold it and then just finally slot the last side in and put it few pegs in just to keep it from falling apart as I manoeuvre. There we have the box and now we just simply slide the acrylic in there. Obviously we would put the egg boxes in the base before we did this. Push that one in. Oh sorry, we sort of the cable for the electrics out through the side and push that piece of perspex in and just to prove the point we'll turn it on and hope tonight that we shall get some visitors that uh, we can re report back on. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'd never get a job on Blue Peter. <laughs> It's great though. It's great. I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what moths you collected in the morning, and uh, I'm sure we're all going to be interested in in that packet. And it took you five minutes to make. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's reasonably simple to to put together. Is one of those things I've been do, using that sort of design for quite a while, so I've got a bit used to it. And but sometimes it, it it's quite handy if you've got somebody to help. But yeah. what I did forget to mention is that the, the LEDs will work off a battery. I'm actually using a little transformer there um, because I haven't got battery to hand, but it, it should work off of a battery pack, um, which will be the next next experiment. Which we can then make sure there's a lovely solar artwork charging. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much, Dave. Uh, um, we're, we're going to just before we go on, I just want to yeah. say that it's not just Dave who's been doing amazing <laughs> things. Um, Joe yeah. has also been inspired by the Moth Project and has been making these gorgeous pin badges. Yes.
Yeah, they are nice. I'm looking forward to wearing mine at the next uh, at the next watch box in September. She, she's been raiding my scrap box, so. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jo. Um, we are now going to look at some art um, and some work of artists and um, this this little bit, this part of the watch moss, I, I got it particularly inspired from a conversation with Amy who, who couldn't be here tonight, but she was talking about the fact that if it wasn't for art, uh, she wouldn't have been getting interested and inspired by moths because she's particularly fond of the pre-Raphaelite art and the way moths were depicted in some of those paintings. And then the more you look into it, you, you, you think, well, you know, all those myths about um, fairies and things like that, little things down the bottom of the garden with wings and all of those were probably inspired by moths. But our, um, the moth expert that comes and uh, has come every time so far and uh, um, has inspired people with films about his moths, he, John Walters, he is now going to talk a little bit and show us a, a film about his interest in moths, uh, um, in art as a way of getting involved and identifying moths as well as for the pleasure of it. John, John, are you there? Hi there. Yeah. Hi. Hello. I yes. hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, we can. can hear me right, okay. Um, great. Are you just about to show the uh, little film? Or, or yes. I was just going to mention my um, nicotiana yeah. plant here. If you have any of these nicotiana plants around you, and I grow these specially, um, this time of year, from now onwards, you may well get visited by a migrant moth called the convolvulus hawk moth. It is a great big moth. It flies up from southern Europe. I see it as a reported one today and they feed on these flowers and they have a 14 centimetre long tongue and they'll come in at dusk and feed on these. So I'm hoping some will turn up in the next couple of weeks. So uh, and if they do, I'll get a little video of it. Oh, could you? And then show us, show us next time. That would be yeah. brilliant. Thanks, John. Yeah, we'll show the film. Jen is just starting it. Okay, great. So it's a little, just a short film about drawing moths. Uh, just how I, how I got into moths is actually, being interested in moths, which got me interested in art. Uh, in the early days when I started in 1976, there weren't many books and there weren't the internet around in those days. So I had to use these old books. And actually I learned a lot about moths by just drawing them. So that was a cypress pug that Richard mentioned earlier. Now this is the convolvulus hawk moth. So I carried on drawing the moths while I was catching them when I was a teenager. And um, then when I was in my twenties, I got really in into drawing in the field. So these are, some of the artists and some of the books which have influenced me over the years and uh, from since then really over the last 30-40 years I've, uh, I've been fascinated by the natural world and explored it through drawing and painting and more recently through photography as well. So I like to get out in the field and draw and paint from life so I never actually draw from photos, I always draw from living creatures. Uh, I've got a basic kit so these are the, these are the six colours I use use some pencils, uh, paper, some water, and then just go out in the field and paint. Uh, this is uh, drawing out in the garden, some hummingbird hawk moth caterpillars, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, in the last 10 or so years, I've been also doing a lot of photography with the advent of uh, modern digital cameras, and they're the ones I use. And so I'm also able to record and observe uh, moths and other wildlife as well using these. Uh, these are some pictures of the burr and green moth. Uh, I'm quite interested in camouflaging moths and painting them. Uh, this is some uh, long haul moths which fly in the spring. These are day flying micro moths that actually the males lek on trees during the springtime. A moth which disguises itself as a bit of bird poo, so the ultimate camouflage really, uh, the Chinese character. And this moth, the red sword grass, uh, disguises itself as a bit of bark because it hibernates as an adult and spends the winter looking like a bit of bark. These are some, just a few studies now of uh, moths which don't have wings. Uh, the females of a number of our moths do not have wings at all. So particularly ones which fly in the winter, like this is a, a scare sunbat and this is a dotted border moth. And as you can see, the, the female moths have tiny little stumps of wings, so they don't fly at all. Um, there's a succession of these moths which fly throughout the winter. Uh, this is one called the early moth, which flies in January. These are the males and they are winged and they're the ones you see fluttering around on winter evenings. Uh, but the females are wingless. 
are all pretty well wingless and they certainly can't fly and they put all their energy into uh, laying eggs. This is a little study just showing um, the life cycle really. I'm quite interested in, in watching moths and just following through their life cycles. There's a hummingbird hawk moth and I found some eggs. So I actually followed them through the whole, the whole progress from the larva developing, changing its skin in turning into a full grown caterpillar, then turning a funny red color uh, before it uh, burrowed sort of into the soil a little bit and, and turned into a pupa. And then finally, uh, watching the moth emerge, the pupa darkens and then the moth hatches out and actually seeing that amazing process of the moth emerging and expanding its wings. Uh, as I said, the camouflage interests me. I like the Mervais du Jour moth, one of my favorite moths which flies in the autumn. And I like to, as well as creating these, uh, this artwork, I like to uh, put it out there as well. So use these, this information that's in the Dartmoor magazine. Uh, talk about it to people. Uh, this is uh, filming for The One Show, a film on Emperor of Moths. Um, and also publish various books. I've published a number of my own books over the years through the Wildlife of Dartmoor, books on mini beasts, and I also regularly put things out on my Twitter site. So it's up in uh, uh, Cumbria last week, uh, watching these Scotch Argus butterflies. Wow, that's lovely, thanks, John. So you, okay. so everybody that's showing such a lovely wide range of, uh, images but you're actually doing the drawing to find out more about the moth it's a very cyclical thing it's yeah it's all about learning really life lifelong learning you never stop no <laughs> and no. drawing there's no real better way even if you don't want to ever show you people your drawings there's no better way really than actually observational drawing uh, to actually learn about the subject because you've really got to look at it and by looking you just learn so much yeah yeah well thank you thanks john for showing us those um, I, we will, if, if other people ask questions as we go, you're, you're getting people saying how lovely they all are there and we'll, we'll make sure that we have the link to your website and so on on our, okay. on our website. Um, and we'll move on from you, John, and, and talk to Sarah now. Um, Sarah Gillespie, who's also kindly agreed to talk about her moth her mesotint art um, on and about moths. So, Sarah, are you, are you there? I'm here. I'm here and I'm unmuted. Can you see me? Yes, we can. Fantastic, thanks. So, um, welcome, welcome to our show, Sarah, and thanks for coming on to tell us more about your art and the work with moths that you've done. You've given Jenny a, a bit of a PowerPoint slideshow type of Thing. So let's, let's, shall we, do you want to start that and start talking through it? I can, I can indeed. Thank you for inviting me. That would be the first thing I'd want to say. I'm, I've got about 16 slides to show you and I'm going to read what I'm going to say. Forgive me for that, but it'll stop me from rambling and gabbling. So um, this is an example of what I do. It's a medicine, it's 20 inches by 20 inches. Or you'll probably all know that it's a swallowtail moth. People often ask me why I choose to make images of moths. The question itself is based both on a misunderstanding and a misconception, or perhaps a preconception. The preconception is that moths are in some way frightening. I realise not to this audience, but the number of people I speak to <laughs> that go, Aah! Um, associated with decay, that one comes from the Bible, or dirty, will get caught in your hair, that's a specialist fear of women, or eat your clothes, of course, which is, um, and well, you all know that that is only one micromoth. From that very negative point of view, I suppose it's a bit odd to want to make them into art. However, I believe it is the job of artists to love the unloved and notice the overlooked and to pay attention. I'll come back to attention. The misunderstanding is that one has much choice in these matters, a bit like moths to flame. The artists don't generally get to choose what. Just got in, you just got muted again. There um, we are. Yeah, now I can click on the slide to change it. There we go. Okay. Can I go back one or not? Don't forget it. There we go. That's a picture of me with my very first moth trap, which is a really, really basic moth trap. You don't, you all know what a moth trap looks like. I now have treated myself during lockdown to a solar, to a, a battery powered one, which I power off the solar panels on my studio. So I feel very virtuous that I trap sunshine during the day and off my glorious solar panels and and then can take my moth trap 
further afield, which gives me great joy. So, I, so um, yeah, my kids tease me that I have two moth traps now. This is, um, and these are some e moths from Exeter Museum. Um, it's an amazing collection at Exeter, and I've spent many hours drawing there, but I'm showing them as an example of what I knew I didn't want to do. I don't want, I've never been interested in representing moths in a way that casts them as a collection of objects. I'm reaching towards something that is much more about a communion of subjects. All my art comes out of a deeply experienced sense of loss, loss and the moth works more than anything I've done before are really all about that. But I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. This is another one of my moths. This is another 20 inch by 20 inch Metzden. This is a pale or light emerald. I've had for 30 plus years a good career as a painter of landscapes. I've shown a great work a great deal and the work has been widely collected. But in recent years, so much of art and the art world that I've been involved with in London and abroad has started to feel so anthropocentric, bordering on narcissistic and self-absorbed. I just couldn't continue with it. I guess it reflects the way we are now caught in the cult of the individual and all trapped in a neoliberal nightmare of consumerism. But it seems to me that there are six million other species on the planet. We're in the middle of the sixth extinction and it has just felt increasingly urgent to turn my attention away from humans and toward the rest of life. Moths offered themselves again and again, so I started to try and humbly learn something about them. I'd just like to reflect here and repeat what John said, that there is nothing like drawing for learning. It is, it is there is no other way to learn than to draw. Really, for this kind of thing, you learn so much. And so this is one of my drawings. This is obviously a poplar hawk moth. This is the sort of thing I do. I, like John, go out after a moth trap and start to, uh, and we'll draw. The big ones, as you all know, will hang around all day delightfully as well. So um, that's, uh, as soon as you start to study and learn about moths, one also realizes that they're a perfect repost to the delusion of separateness. They're so completely tied into ecosystems, so dependent on specific plants and habitats, so much a part of the breaking down of things and the continuance of life that they can't in any way be seen as separate. And of course, if you study them, you start to reflect on that. So now I'm jumping to something that might look like a bit of a weird jump. This is a mezzotin rocker. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I make the images and, and hopefully come around to explaining why. I needed to find a medium when I started. I mean, I'd been drawing moths for about 10 years and I started wanting to make something more serious around them. And I needed a medium that went beyond just representing the remarkable beings and lighted upon mezzotint or la manière noire, as it's also known. Invented in the 17th century, this form of engraving on copper is painstaking and slow, but allows me in a unique way to show both the way moths seem to emerge, to reveal themselves and how they are disappearing from our lives. These toothed rockers are used to make thousands of pits in a smooth copper plate that will hold the sticky printing ink and print a velvety black. You rock the plate, in fact, in 64 different directions until the plate is entirely abraded. So um, this slide shows a poplar hawk moth engraving in progress. The slide shows me slowly scraping away the roughened, the now roughened surface of the copper to draw out an image of a poplar hawk moth. The smoother I can scrape and burnish the copper, the paler it will print. In this way, one achieves an extraordinary range of tones. Here's another plate in progress. This is a sallow kitten moth. You can see my glasses. I've actually just bought some um, micro stronger glasses, <laughs> stewing my eyes in. Um, this is a white ermine moth. The long hours of engraving this way, about a month per plate, take, allow for something closer to intimacy a conversation, less of a subject-object dichotomy that comes with painting, and I value that conversation more than I can say. This is the privet hawk moth plate being inked. When the engraving is complete, the plate is inked up and wiped with scrim. So this is me wiping the plate. The process on a big plate such as this can take up to an hour to ink and wipe. You carefully wipe to leave the ink in the pits and grooves, but take off the smooth surfaces. It's then, this is the garden tiger moth plate, the inked plate, sorry. The inked plate is then passed through a very heavy press and the image is pressed into damp paper under great pressure. I've been printing since I was about 18 and this moment of revelation that you're seeing here never loses its magic. 
This is a pale emerald moth. Sorry, that slides sideways, but never mind. That, that is the, the, that's there. In that one, you can see both the plate and the print. It's just come off the press. After 20 or so impressions, the plate wears out. So the additions are limited. Each one is carefully flattened and dried and then, being num then is numbered and signed. Oh, can we go back? Jenny, is that possible? I accidentally have gone to, thank you. This is the white plume or phantom. I'll run through some of the 20 metastints I've made of moths in the last 18 months. I love these white plume moths. They always make me think of WB Yeats when you come across them. A line of his, all things hang like a drop of dew upon a blade of grass. I started making them really because I couldn't go and lie down and be arrested with Extinction Rebellion and I needed to do something. So I decided to take 18 months out of the commercial art world and the, um, the big London Mayfair glitzy art world and dedicate myself quite really seriously, do nothing else except study moths. As I'm not a, a lepidopterist or a scientist, so I, I really had a lot of learning to do. This, I also made the decision I would uncompromisingly talk about my art in these terms as opposed to talking about it in the usual way one talks about art. And, and that in itself has been quite an extraordinary experience. I've met a lot of resistance. This is a four spot footman, four spotted footman, um, sometimes the poetry is in the name. I've come to think of the English pre Linnaean names as part of our heritage. There should be an outcry at their disappearance, and yet it's a near silent wiping out, not just the animals themselves, but of our natural history. The names are exquisite, and they were definitely part of what drew me into it. We have a Hebrew character, another great name. At this point, I want to return to the idea of attention. In order to really pay attention, we have to do something very unfashionable and very unwestern. We have to empty ourselves out let go of our intensive attachment to the details of our own lives. Only then, as the great Chinese poet Du Fu said, only when we are wholly empty does the act of perception become a spiritual practice. So white ermine. I happen to think paying attention is also a radical and revolutionary practice. All the damage we have done to find, us, to find ourselves in the Anthropocene has come about by carelessness not looking, not paying attention to anything other than our own needs and profits. Opening our eyes and paying deep attention to the more than human world might be the only chance we have of reversing the disaster we find ourselves in. I did pull all of these moth images together into a book because the poet Alice Oswald, who I, I know only vaguely, sent me, I mean, it was the most extraordinary thing, she sent me a poem that she'd written about moths having looked at my prints. So it seemed the only way to honour the gift of the poem was to put them together in a book with my mezzotint. So that's what this is. And there's a longish interview in it about the thinking behind it. And lastly, that's just one other little book I wrote with my uncle who writes on climate catastrophe um, specifically. And that's, so that's just one we wrote about how an artist's, I mean, it's clear what scientists have to do and they are doing extraordinary and valuable work, but how does an artist respond? And what is the appropriate response to the catastrophe we find ourselves in for artists? I don't believe it's good enough to just carry on as we were. So that's the two of us having conversations about what might, um, what, ha what, might, what might be, what we should do to carry a gift is to carry a responsibility. And we try to think around that and how we might turn away from exploitation and tell a different story. And um, that's the end of my slideshow. Quite happy. Are there any questions or we, uh, we, might, we might go to something else now? Lovely. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah. You're very welcome. Um, I'm just looking to see whether I have any questions there. There was... I rattled through that at some speed, so I... There was, there's um, there's a, somebody called Ellie out there who said, um, what so, it's a very practical question, but what sort of burnisher do you use? <laughs> I've got, tell her, I've got, tell her, Ellie, I've got lots of burnishers. Oh, I'm right, tool. she's pulling her legs, you know that. <laughs> I've got, I'm a tool collector. <laughs> oh, right, yes. Um, and and a, a lot of very positive responses to that um brilliant thought-provoking stunning ideas so every, everybody's very um seems like they've been very pleased to hear and see see your work and i would mostly echo what john had to say is that yes. i would encourage everybody to draw moths, yeah. not yeah. to make them up not to sort of 
fantasize about what moths might be, but to look at them and draw, it's, there's nothing like it. So. Okay, so um, there's some thumbs up there. I, th I think that uh, maybe if we have homework then for the next month, Yes. <laughs> the next watch moths, those of us that um, have a moment to look carefully at a piece of nature, maybe a moth, but a piece of nature to get a pencil out and or get some some mark making thing out and uh, look look carefully and spend time drawing drawing it. Oh. That would be good. <laughs> Our, um, the whole we had a short conversation before um, mm -hmm. this evening, and we we recognise that um, the Art and Energy Collective is also in its way this whole moths to a flame program of work is is our way at the moment of exploring what we can do as artists and makers in, in the face of uh, climate change. So thank you for agreeing to come and to give us your view and your way of, of uh, starting to take steps towards doing whatever you do next. <laughs> I think you have, you know, we have to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Thanks to Sarah, thanks to John for showing his amazing art. And we have, yes, we have more or less uh, run out of time now. Um, but Jenny was going to finish off. Are you, Jenny, going to finish off with a different, completely different form of art again with the yep. reality moths? Okay, what? so first of all, I would like to just point you all in the direction of the Art and Energy website, which is, um, now has our shop over where is it at the top here our shop area so you can buy copies of miranda's beautiful book um, and as chloe said for the month of august if you pop your when you get through to the, the shop kind of the end bit then there'll be a, a section for notes and you're able to put in if you would like a dedication in there for miranda and then there are lots of other ways of getting involved um, I haven't quite got round to putting the next lot of tickets on for the, the September lot, but they will be on there in the next day. Um, obviously, we've got tomorrow morning's big reveal as well yet to come. So uh, we've also got the colouring, the augmented reality moth. Um, we've got our poetry competition, which there'll be more about tomorrow. Recording your message of hope for COP26, which um, I don't know if you can see this, um, is over on the right hand side of the screen as you look at the website. Um, and also generally signing up or sending us an email to let us know how you found this evening, how you can imagine the project developing, um, how you would like to get involved um, and how you've stopped and paid more attention perhaps after Sarah's talk of, to the world around us and, and how that's inspired you. Um, and then um, with the augmented reality moths, um, I'm just going to see if I can spotlight my video. Um, so just as a kind of an introduction, Sorry, my background's doing funny things. Um, the augmented reality moth sounds a bit scary, um, but actually, in actual fact, it's a colouring sheet for you to colour in with standard pencils and pens and crayons. And you can also, we've had some artists having fun placing items onto the colouring sheet um, and then bringing it to life using their mobile phone or their tablet. Um, and I'm going to show you now a few examples that we had through. So, what we're inviting you to do is to um, to colour in your sheet, to decorate your sheet in whatever way you can imagine, um, to uh, bring it to life on your phone or your tablet, to record a short video, and then that will then sort of save onto your device, um, and then share it with us either through email or by posting it on social media using the hashtag Mox to Play. So all that's doing is then we are able to collect those in if you put in the hashtag moths to a flame in there. Um, let's see if this is going to move on to the next slide for me. I don't think it is. But those, as you can see, some absolutely beautiful videos um, there. The majority of them My have hope been for the future is filmed. for me to become a marine biologist and help all sea life, including turtles. But if you choose to do so, you can also record your hope for the future on here. My hope for the future is that people will be kinder to our planet by polluting it less.
two young ladies who clearly aren't scared of moth. So we're inviting you to create, record and share. Um, and as I say, www.artandenergy.org. And if you're not up for the colouring side of things, um, and um, we, we don't expect artworks um, like Sarah's beautiful moth um, or John's, um, use your imagination if, if you'd like and, and go vibrant and crazy and, and wacky uh, designs on there, um, full of life and, and so on. Uh, but you can also go onto the website and just do the, the whisper of hope for the future as your audio. Um, and we're collecting those. We're, we're really keen to collect those over the next week or so because we're working with a, an artist called Ali Kim. And she's going to be collating those to create a, a digital artwork to present at Plymouth Art Weekender. Um, and that will then continue to grow over the next, what is it, 15 months or so um, to then take up to Glasgow to COP26. Um, so please do get involved. Um, yeah. Um, so it's just, I guess, all that's left is to remind you that tomorrow morning we will be back um, 8 a.m. till 9 a.m. Um, I'm going to pass over to Naomi for a recap of what's on there because all I can think about is augmented reality moth now. Yeah, well, yeah, so thank you for coming uh, this evening and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. This time we've sent a little reminder to you because we get people saying they, they've just kept sleeping, sleeping in. Well, you're not allowed to. <laughs> You've got the moth experts with their moth traps all night. So um, you have to get up at 10 to 8 and find screen, <laughs> watch what moths in the morning. Um, and we'll be um, having a bit of poetry and um, generally getting the reveal of all, all moths, a bit of science and yes. So and there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with taking a cup of tea and your tablet back to bed with you. And we've noticed that the, the AM ones, we definitely have fewer, fewer smiley faces because I think people, people enjoy it on a, on a Saturday morning, sitting cosy and uh, having, enjoying a cup of tea with them. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So see you tomorrow morning then. And, and thank you to all our contributors this evening and to Plymouth Energy Community and the Arts Council for funding us a little bit. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. I'm going to press end now and look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow morning. Good night.